Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Edward Simpson, and I'm the director of the SOAS South Asia Institute. Um, I'm here to welcome you to the SOAS pre-COP event, day two, um, which we've called Global Perspectives. This conference is um, the result of collaboration of different parts of SOAS, the University of London, the Centre for Development Policy, the Centre for Sustainable Finance, the South Asia Institute and other regional centres and institutes whose logos have not made it onto this beautiful looking slide. So yesterday, in part one of this event, we heard from colleagues at SOAS about research across disciplines and across areas. And to me, there was some things that came out clearly as examples of SOAS expertise. The first was policy and process research. We clearly had strengths in finance and critical thinking about financial mechanisms. But perhaps uh, more surprisingly, and in some ways for me, heartwarming, we also have a strength in the environmental humanities. And perhaps across these two pieces, I saw interest in knowledge politics, knowledge politics in the most kind of abstract sense. So how do we know? How do we trust? What do we respond to? How do we change things? How do we engage? I'm an anthropologist and I'm very interested in these kinds of questions. What is belief, conviction? Where does it come from? Why do we hold things so dear? What role does a politics of the left or a politics of the right play in our knowledge? and our approach to things like climate change and social change? What role does religion or culture, and importantly, geography, play in the way that we think about climate change and we approach COP? So geography is the focus of today's talk in some ways. We're moving out of London. We're moving into the regions that SOAS works with. We have a range of high profile and very well known speakers, commentators, researchers, who are going to talk with an edge on COP. Yesterday, we used the unusual format of Pecha Kucha presentations where speakers had about seven minutes to talk. Today, we're going to be even more experimental and give academics an unstructured 10 minutes um, which is, I think, a more risky format even than the one yesterday. But I mentioned this just to draw colleagues' attention to that 10 minutes magical time limit, but also to introduce you who have joined us for this part two of this event, that we've intended from the outset for this event to be experimental, for it to be lively, and for us to be able to reach a wider range and a more diverse audience than an academic conference usually would. Thus the short presentations, the irreverent approach to geography and discipline in some ways, but we're all brought together by thinking through the challenges of COP. So thank you very much. I'm a host for the day, but I'm going to now pass you to Tom Tanner, who's a colleague at SOAS, chair for the Center for Geography, Development, Environment, and Policy. He's going to say a few words of introduction before the program starts. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Ed, and uh, thanks all for joining us, including those uh, watching the live stream, and if you're watching back on, on the videos that we've posted. Uh, I'm really excited that we've got such an amazing array of speakers today. Um, I think I'd add to Ed that the, this the central concept of SOAS of working in partnership with others and trying to understand different perspectives than our own and recognizing that we may not think, uh, be able to think in ways that others think. And that's what we're interested in, in discovering and part of our attempts to decolonize knowledge and our curriculum and accept that, you know, we're a product of uh, where we were brought up, how we were educated and our experiences and that, you know, we're open to hearing from others. Now, today, we're really fortunate to hear from some others who have uh, really uh, varied and also long track records uh, working in the climate change space. And uh, yeah, I'm just uh, really happy to have them uh, here with us. And I hope you enjoy 
hearing from hearing from them too. And we'll kick off with some perspectives from uh, South Asia and, uh, and and move through some of the other parts of the world. Thanks. Tom, thank it's, you very much. So we have seven talks this morning. Um, timekeeping is of the essence. I won't go on about that any more than I already have. But first, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Professor Navaraj Dubash to SOAS. Welcome, Navaraj. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Navaraj is a professor at the Center for Policy Research, which is in a leafy part of Delhi. Uh, it's a very nice place. If you're passing by, I'd highly recommend the hospitality of CPR. Uh, Navaraj is editor and author of some very influential publications, uh, India in a Warming World, Mapping Power, and the Handbook of Climate Change in India, which is one of my most referred to books. It's the closest one, actually, to my desk very often. So it's nice to see you in, in person, even if we're on Zoom. He's also the author of a, an award-winning paper on India's energy and emissions future, which I would encourage those of you interested in emissions politics and energy politics to read. Uh, Navaraj is also the coordinating lead author of the IPCC um, current writing project. So Navaraj and Tom are going to enter into some magical form of Q&A, which I look forward to. Uh, welcome to SOAS. Uh, and thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you so much, Edward. I'm really delighted to to join this uh, this event and look forward to the experimental format. And thanks to Thomas for willing to being willing to engage me in conversation. We should we should get to it. Not at all. Let's get to it. Um, so, you know, Navroz, your, your name has been associated, I guess, with the with, with climate change for for a long time, and you were involved right back in the early days of formations of the. UNFCCC, but importantly, you're known for starting the civil society side of the engagement. Um, tell us a little bit about your experiences way back when, in what, the 1990s, early 1990s, uh, and setting up that civil society side of, of, of the UN processes. Right. Uh, thanks, Thomas. It, it, it does take, uh, take me back uh, a ways. So, uh, in 1990, when the UN FCCC process hadn't really started, it was then the INC process, the International Negotiating Committee, uh, a few enterprising uh, civil society types realized that uh, they were rubbing shoulders with uh, just a handful of people, largely from Europe, uh, the US, and a couple from Australia. Uh, and if we wanted to have more of a civil society role in the climate negotiations, which were then sort of ramping up, uh, in particular from other geographies, there needed to be some proactive efforts uh, to, to get people there. And so I had happened to work on some climate related um, projects, uh, literally in college, and they, they, they needed somebody uh, to try and dig out people and bring them in. And so I got hired, uh, it was a little bit of a gamble, I think. Uh, and we managed to uh, identify a lot of very interesting people uh, in India, people like Sunita Narayan, who is now, of course, well known, and, and Anil Agarwal, uh, uh, then head of Center for Science and Environment. Uh, one of your speakers uh, later on, Salim ul uh, was one of our interlocutors, uh, along with his colleague Atik Rahman from Bangladesh, and several others who have actually stayed involved. So it was a fabulous effort at network building. Uh, I will say that it is uh, uh, oh, now certainly only one among several civil society voices, and I think it's and the world is uh, the the the, the uh, climate advocacy world is richer for the fact that there are a multiplicity of voices. But CAN has been remarkably uh, consistent and stayed the course, uh, and it was a very exciting time for me personally. And it's it's great to see CAN still around. CAN, of course, is the Climate Action Network uh, International. So that's that's really the the, the backdrop. Uh, and I will say that I then kind of after having done that for a couple of years through Rio, I went off and did something completely different uh, for a decade plus. Uh, and I think really where the climate debate has matured, and we're seeing this now in Paris, is that climate isn't sort of in, uh, a sort of a, a little diplomatic space that's boxed off. It's much more interwoven with broader development conversations. And I think that's that's where we are now in climate debates. And that's where I think this conversation probably will, will go as well. Thank you. Yeah, but you're, you're back involved, obviously, more heavily now in, in climate change work. Uh, obviously, you know, our interaction was particularly around the air pollution uh, and the climate in India. But 
how how do you see the Indian perspective now, um, as opposed to how it's evolved through the through the progression of the UNFCCC since since the early nineties? What's the right. what's the Indian take, and how has it changed? So so um, uh, I think. India was among the, the countries really advocating very strongly a position on climate equity, uh, which we, which of course both civil society and the government uh, continue to do. But I think what has really changed, and this is in a sense, uh, you know, uh, um, there's a personal arc here that that kind of that kind of has tracked this 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 national and global arc. Um, what has changed, I think, is the realization that a lot of mainstream development decisions are actually relevant to climate outcomes, and that there are a lot of development decisions that actually are uh, uh, convergent with positive climate outcomes. So when you're building your cities, when you're building public transport networks, you're building a more livable city, but you're also building a city that is better uh, able to contribute to the mitigation challenge. So that realization combined with growing awareness of the vulnerability that India faces uh, from climate change, as well as I think the coming of age of India as a geopolitical actor, at least the attempted coming of age of India as a geopolitical actor, uh, means that India, that, that sort of diplomatically, we don't want to be above the parapet in a sense, uh, or in the firing line, you know, pick your metaphor, when it comes to climate change, where we were for, for quite a long time. Um, and so I think, I think there's been a conscious effort to both change how we talk about climate change uh, in India and not make it only an us, them, north, south, uh, you go first, we'll follow later kind of story. That remains, of course. But while that is very much part of the narrative, it is also a story now about what can we do domestically that will make India a more sustainable and livable place while also contributing to climate change. And it turns out that there's actually quite a lot. So I think that's what that shift in realization has opened political doors. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's that reflects a little bit on um, the talk yesterday from Leo Horn Pathanatai from WRI, who spoke about uh, these compatibilities and you know simple co-benefits between having a, a city that's more connected and uh, better to live in and and climate benefits. Is that something that's taken off the smart cities initiative in, in India is you know known about around the world? Is that something that has there's a sense that that's driving a climate agenda, but quietly the climate agenda in the background and pushing forward the more developmental benefits first? Well, uh, well, part of my frustration, to be honest, Thomas, is that is that we talk we talk a good line, but often there just isn't the effort capacity and thought that goes into translating that into both policy and, and action on the ground. So smart city sounds good, but has there been enough deliberation about what a smart city looks like in the era of climate change? I'm not sure the answer to that is, is yes. So we haven't really uh, uh, been able to bring these things together in a way that is, that is, uh, that is uh, entirely useful or, or practical. I think there's a lot of space that's opened up because of some of the changes in rhetoric, but we haven't populated that space in a way that is uh, uh, quite, as, uh, quite as productive, I think, uh, as, as we should. That seems fair enough. Uh, bringing things closer to, to Glasgow, it's uh, 10 days away, nine days away. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Indian perspective on uh, COP26, certainly from a re you know, researcher perspective? Uh, what right. What characterizes India's approach? Right. Well, um, I, I see a question has popped up on the chat now. I'll try and take a crack at that uh, uh, as well. Uh, so I think when I talked of, uh, a little while ago about, about how perhaps there's kind of a narrative that, that gets out ahead of, of, of the policy and the, and, the, and, the, and the deliberation, I think part of the problem is that we India gears up for a COP uh, just a few months before it happens. Um, and so a lot of the attention ends up being focused on making sure that, you know, as I said, that we're not in the filing line. Where does climate action track the rank India and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and that's, that's a shame, really, because there is a lot of political momentum, uh, but it just gets get dissipated in a, in a short period of time instead of sustaining something that's, uh, that's much longer. So I, I do think that right now there's a lot of conversation in India, and I'm not privy to the insider part of that, but conversation about India upgrading its NDC. Now, if we had been having a sustained conversation about this, I think we could have been a very useful and interesting conversation about how we interweave climate 
with urban challenges, with the story about the call to renewable transition. And that was what the question uh, uh, was about. So there's been internal debate. I and others have written that the time may have come for India to declare no new coal-fired power plants, uh, which doesn't mean we won't burn any more coal, um, because we actually have uh, a fair number of plants that are burning less than they could. So there's sort of a little bit of headroom there, but at least we won't be adding new plants. And of course, renewable energy is going up at, at, quite, a, at quite a pace. We should be having conversations about, about things like that. I think, I think India is going to come to the table with uh, uh, very familiar calls about for, for finance and, and, and technology support. Uh, but I do think that there will be some form of upgrade uh, in terms of the NDC. Again, don't hold me to that. I'm not in the, uh, you know, sort of, uh, 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 I, I don't have a crystal ball on this, but I think there's, there's conversation uh, about it. Uh, I think what's very, what, what India should really be thinking about though, in my view, is on a sector by sector level, what can we do differently? Uh, and yeah, I just would like to sort of make a, 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 sl a small detour. There's been a very active debate in India about the value, about the virtues and the problems of net zero formulations. And I'm among those who think that for a country like India where energy needs are growing steeply, a net zero formulation off into the distant future is less likely to drive change than a sector by sector conversation of how you bring development and climate together. How do you decarbonize electricity? How do you have uh, fewer tons of carbon, per, of, uh, less carbon per passenger mile traveled in transport? How do you do that in the building sector? That intersection with development makes it much more likely to bring about action. What a country like India needs to do, and we, we talked about this separately, you know, what is sort of an, an Indian take on, on climate change. I think a country like India has to actually work really hard to avoid emissions, right? We're not that we haven't peaked. We're probably not gonna peak for a bit, we have to develop in a way where we don't lock into a high carbon future that you then subsequently have to unwind. We don't want to do the China path where we lock, where we kind of substantially lock into high carbon and then we try and unwind fast. We want to have a much shallower, flatter trajectory. Uh, and I think if India could make that case uh, for the world thinking about what it would take for India to move to that shallower, flatter trajectory, I think that would be a really positive contribution. I'm noticing we're pretty much out of time. Uh, so I want to uh, follow Edward's uh, uh, injunction. No, no, my minutes. clock still says uh, nine minutes 50. So uh, ah, just okay, a, 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 last, a last little um, input really, which is the question is, it's a very simple and short, short, easy to answer question is what can an Indian perspective to climate change bring to the rest of the world? What have you learned uh, nationally that you can take um, to, to the rest of the world? Well, I think the uh, I think some of the some of the some of what we know is 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 commonplace now, right? We have to spend a lot more time on adaptation, and vulnerable countries have to really focus on adaptation. We give it a lot of lip service; it doesn't get nearly the space uh, it deserves. And I'll let Salim uh, talk much more about that. But the other piece of this is, if you want to drive development and climate change together, you may not want to have conversations about tons of carbon right off the bat and about net zero. You want to have conversations about, about how do you uh, achieve multiple objectives of development and climate change in ways that reinforce each other and that avoid synergies. It's a different framing of the problem. And the war we make this about sort of a, you know, show us the tons uh, 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 and the certainty of the ton reduction, it doesn't make sense for a country where emissions are going to increase, right? It's, a, it's actually, it's the increase at a slower pace and in ways that don't uh, lock you into carbon. Uh, and I believe that's best done in a, in a, in a sort of sector by sector development uh, driven sort of way. Great, I mean, that partly answers one of the questions on the, on the chat, which is, uh, is India on track to meet its NDCs? And you're essentially saying that the, this long-term trajectory of, 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 of plotting NDCs and these you know, commitment based, like, are you on track? Are you going to yeah, meet the number well, of Gigatons. Well, well, I, I look. I, I, I think I think the Paris mechanism is, is is really helpful in in spurring and stimulating domestic conversation. I feel like India has not done enough in using that that opportunity. And look, I mean, I'm fine with tracking tons and, and so on and so forth, but it needs to be near term, right? I think what I'd like to see is a lot more emphasis from the industrialized countries. And we've seen that shift in the course of this year on what you're going to do in the next ten years, what you're going to do in 2050. Uh, is less useful if you're going to backload it. Let's front load our actions, please. 
And in developing countries that are increasing their emissions, it's imperative to front load because you don't want to lock into high carbon, the China story, and try and unwind that, unwind that later. So I would kind of bring the lens forward a bit. Say, let's focus a, a bit more on the next 10 years and how do we get political scalability of low carbon infrastructures? And that's the other piece of it, right? A lot of this is about infrastructure development, which, which tends to have decadal timeframes. We need to make sure that infrastructure is compatible with the low carbon future. And we need to do that right now. Fantastic, Navros, that's that was really fascinating. And uh, thank you so much for your insights. And um, yeah, we shall take them, we, we shall blend them a little with, as you say, we got early, um, discussions and collaborations with uh, Professor Salimul Hook, who we're going to hear from um, next by way of a, a video. He's unable to make it today, but I spoke to him at the weekend, recorded a little video, put a few edits into it to make it a bit more exciting. So hopefully, um, if Sunil can can play that for us now, um, we'll hear from him. Thanks so much, Navaroz. Thank you very much for having me on. So a warm welcome to Professor Salimul Huck, who's from Bangladesh. Uh, he's a very much an old timer in the COP process. He's been going to all the COPs since COP1. And in fact, before COP, when the UNFCCC was, was signed at the uh, Rio conference back in 1992. So he, he's seen the evolution. And uh, first I invite you to tell, tell us something about that evolution and where COP26 sits with, in relation to that wider evolution of UNFCCC. Well, I give you, thank you very much, Tom, for inviting me. I'll give you my potted uh, history of the COP uh, over the last 25 uh, or more years. Uh, I call it the three eras of uh, climate change, and it, it's to do with how we have perceived the issue of climate change and, and therefore how we have taken actions or not taken actions. So the first perception that came out of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which are the scientists warning the rest of the world that climate change is going to happen if we don't take actions, led to everybody coming together in Rio, signing the convention, and then ever since then having an annual meeting, the COP, uh, to uh, track process. And the first thing was, it's about emissions of greenhouse gases, uh, we don't want to do that. We need to reduce it. So we all agreed to reduce it. And that in climate change jargon, we call mitigation. Uh, but we didn't. We, we agreed to do it, but we did. And then a few years later, um, we had a number of COPs. And then in around the turn of the century, after, at the third assessment report of the IPCC, it pointed out, scientists pointed out, that we haven't done enough mitigation. We are now, unfortunately, locked into some degree of warming and that's going to have consequences and that we're going to have to deal with that and that poor people are going to suffer more than rich people are and so it's a development issue not just an environmental issue and that's when the development world started getting involved uh, uh, developing countries develop but uh, development agencies like the un and the world bank etc and that's the second era i call uh, the adaptation era when we start thinking about adapting to climate change not that mitigation should be stopped it has to continue but it hasn't been enough so we now need to adapt we are now on the cusp of moving into the third era which i call the era of loss and damage because the sixth assessment report of ipcc has just come out a couple of months ago saying that we are now unequivocally seeing seeing not anticipating seeing the impacts of human induced climate change attributable to human beings causing that uh, impact and therefore, we are seeing loss and damage from climate change attributable to human beings causing that loss and damage, no longer natural impacts alone. And therefore, we're going to have to deal with this third era. Uh, and so that makes COP26 an extremely important COP because it's the first COP of this new era. And it needs to rise to the challenge of dealing with this new era of loss and damage, which I don't see it doing. So does that, do I detect some some pessimism for, for, for the outcomes of COP26? Indeed, indeed. So I've, I've been an optimist, as, as you said, I've been to all the COPs. I should uh, point out I, I never went as a negotiator. I'm not a negotiator, uh, but I, I'm an independent observer. I'm an academic a researcher, but I do have a role. I advise the least developed countries, which is 48 of the poorest countries uh, currently chaired by Bhutan. So in the negotiations, I'm an advisor to them on the issues of adaptation and loss and damage. So I do have a role behind the scenes in, in providing advice. Um, and 
until now I have been an optimist of getting everybody together, but because particularly for the poorest countries, like the least developed countries, this is the only place where they have a say. Any other gathering, you know, the G20, the G7, or whatever other gathering of, of the uh, big and famous excludes them. So the UNFCC is the only place where they have a say. Not that they can do much with that say, but occasionally they can. And the biggest outcome for them was in the Paris Agreement, getting the 1.5 degree uh, goal against very stiff odds uh, enshrined in the Paris Agreement. So now it's all about uh, delivering on that promise, on that pledge, which we are not in shape to do, but we have to do. And so the least developed countries in particular uh, will be pushing for staying on track for 1.5 degrees. At the moment, we're headed for 2.7, better than 3.5, but still nowhere near 1.5. So we're going to have to up the action. And secondly, for the most vulnerable countries, there was a pledge made in Paris from the rich countries to provide $100 billion a year, starting from 2020. Money never appeared. We're nowhere near even the first $100 billion of that. Uh, we certainly missed 2020. We're now at the end of 2021. There should be $200 billion on the table now, but there's nowhere near. There's not even the first $100 billion uh, that was promised. So again, uh, cause for pessimism. So um, you're, you're director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development. It was the, certainly the first and is almost certainly the, still the foremost um, international centre on climate change, certainly based in the, in the global south. Um, it's got quite a legacy behind it now. But you've also worked with the Bangladeshi government, um, advising them and, from, and obviously from an LDC perspective until recently. And what would you say are the key issues for COP26 from a Bangladesh perspective? Well, Bangladesh, I would say three things very quickly. Firstly, Bangladesh is one of the most vulnerable countries. Uh, we've known that for a long time, you know, well over you know, a decade and a half when you were in Bangladesh, uh, we, we all knew about that. So it's not new news to us. And we haven't been sitting idle. Bangladesh has been doing a hell of a lot in terms of going up a learning curve on how to adapt to the impacts of climate change. So we have a lot, we have learned a lot. We have a lot to learn, but we also have a lot to teach the rest of the world. As it happens, this particular year, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, also happens to be the chair of a group of vulnerable countries called the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is nearly 50 countries. They're not a negotiating group like the LDC group or the small island states. They, they come from the different negotiating groups, and it's a political level group uh, chaired by the Prime Minister herself. Uh, and this group was the one that was instrumental in the 1.5 agreement in COP21. At that time, under the leadership of President Aquino of the Philippines, and I, I am one of the expert advisors of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, uh, I have been for many years. So this year, Bangladesh and our Prime Minister, who I understand will be in Glasgow, will be speaking not only for Bangladesh, but for the Climate Vulnerable Forum countries as a whole. And there are three demands. The one is we have to keep 1.5 on track. That was our number one demand from the very beginning. 1.5 came from us. Secondly, the 100 billion that was promised has to be delivered. Half of it needs to go for adaptation. So far, you know, whatever money has been delivered, only 20% of that has gone for adaptation in the vulnerable countries. That's not right. We're asking for half of it. And then thirdly, uh, the under Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, the Climate Vulnerable Forum has taken up this time for the first time, the issue of loss and damage, because as I said, it is now, an era of loss and damage and we have to deal with that fantastic and uh you know are you are you confident for from from a bangladeshi perspective what what might be achieved at, at cop 26 and those with regard to those demands is a is glass half full glass half empty well i think i am personally a glass half full type of person but i don't see the filling part of the glass coming from governments uh, that's where my pessimism about COPs now comes into play. But I do see the filling part coming from non-state actors. And there will be many of us, and I'm one of them as well. I'm not a state actor, I'm a non-state actor. Many of us will be in Glasgow. I hope you'll be there, we'll meet up. And we are the ones who have to deliver on giving us this opportunity to escape the worst impacts of climate change. Um, and I think we can do it, but we cannot rely on our governments to do it alone. They have failed us time and time again, and I'm absolutely certain they'll fail us again. So do, do you think the COP's actually the right place for those actors to actually make these things? Or is, is the COP, you know, not fit for purpose? Is it got the wrong people there talking about the wrong things? I think the right people are in the city. 
where the COP is held, but they're not the ones who, the right people aren't the ones who are given the platform. I've, I've argued after the Paris Agreement was achieved that we should uh, have what, we, what I call inside out COPs, where the negotiators, you know, who spend all night negotiating over commas and words in a completely arcane language that is completely unintelligible to the wider public, put them in the back rooms and let them negotiate all night if they want to and give the main plenary floors to actors who are doing things. They can be CEOs of companies, they can be mayors of cities, they can be parliamentarians, they can be academics like you and I, they can be grassroots groups, indigenous groups, uh, young people's groups. Give them the stage for telling people what they are doing because a lot is happening. They are doing a lot. And to me, the actions speak louder than words. And the people doing the actions need to be given center stage. And the people who are just fighting over words should be given the backstage. And if they come up with something good at the end, fine, we listen to them, but don't hang on their words and their negotiations. It's extremely difficult. So my, my advice to any uh, journalist that I'm talking to is don't look for answers or the story is not in the blue zone where the negotiators are going to be. The story in Glasgow is outside the blue zone. It's what other people are doing. Go and cover that. And there'll be hundreds of them. They'll be, we'll be all, you know, telling about our stories of what we're doing. That to me is what the outcome of COP26 should be. And if we can make that happen, then I'll say the COPs may still be fit for purpose, but with a redesigned purpose. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your perspectives, Professor Salim al -Huk. Um, we wish you well in Glasgow and I'll see you there, no doubt. Um, and thanks a lot for contributing to this uh, session on regional perspectives. Thanks. Thank you. So I hope you in, uh, enjoyed that. It's uh, always fascinating to hear Salim talk. And I think this, uh, it may take a few years, but this, this sentiment around the inside out COP process is, is closer than you imagine. I, 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 you see the media in the build up to this year's COP are much more interested in the people who are actually taking the actions. So to some extent, holding politicians to account, you know, it, you, you have these long term goals. What's your short term actions that, that Navarroz touched on? But actually, there's so much happening in, in the non state actors and in, in, in some of the state actors as well. So we heard yesterday about how cities and you know mayors in cities are, are, are willing to take action even in, in in places where their national governments aren't uh, so active and uh, and leading, so I hope we're able to take some of, forward some of those ideas. I saw some nodding from panelists uh, on our screens, so hopefully we take some of those forward in uh, in the subsequent talks. I thought we'd take a moment now um, to involve those who are who are watching online on Zoom and uh, a little poll, and just to ask you, I'm going to put the um, code for a, a Mentimeter poll. Do click on it, it's in the chat now. The poll is around uh, your own level of expertise, where you see yourselves. It helps the uh, the speakers as well to get a sense of, um, of the audience and the extent to which you feel like you are um, an expert or otherwise in climate change. So please do go there and vote and I'll share my screen and we can look at some other results. So a nice half half of those who voted uh, know the basics but want to know more. So it's good to know for uh, for the speakers to to pitch pitch their uh, discussion. The graphic has not appeared on the shared screen yet. Oh, I beg your pardon. It is a little bit. I'm afraid my screen has glitched. Oh, there we go. Are we good? I had the wheel of death for a moment there. I was rather worried. Okay, so we definitely got most people as kind of wanting to know more about climate change and a few uh, super experts, probably equal with those who are who are mostly new to the to the process. That's great to know. Thank you. Ed. How would you how would you recommend um, the people who are in the pink category move um, to the red category? 
or even beyond to the yellow category? Well, those who are in the academic sphere um, and have the have the chance to to attend uh, events like this, I think there's a there's a real space for the kind of climate change 101 and something we're trying to do, obviously, within SARS and obviously other you know other universities that we partner with, like like Salim's Institute in, in Bangladesh, to try and help improve and build that that base level of those who understand. Um, so through short courses, events like this, uh, as well as the um, more formalized academia. But those who are, you know, who are studying at the moment do hunt, hunt these things out, and particularly this year, actually, um, certainly from the UK, there's been a real push across the university sector to, to reach out and, you know, to, to publics, not just to their own students. Um, um, but there's, there's so much reading to be had. The main thing is look for your sources and, you know, don't take it off your Facebook feed that's been sent by your crazy friend. Um, uh, try and look for those kind of more independent sources, but also do look for those sources within, you know, the place where you live. So whether it be, you know, local local perspectives on, on, on the climate crisis or, or national ones in, in your own country. I mean, for me, the, the local perspectives are really important. I think one of the lessons from working around the world and in my own uh, region of the UK has been to situate it in issues that are, you know, pertinent to the local area. So, you know, the, the classic polar bear adrift on a, uh, an ice flow doesn't really speak to, to people living in semi-arid areas. Um, there are more pressing concerns locally, and that's what you need to engage with. So. Brilliant, Tom. Thank you. OK, so we are slightly ahead of schedule, but that's that's a good thing, I think, in my view. Uh, it, it gives me a pleasure to welcome Dr. Pierre Eshubar to SOAS. Welcome. Uh, I don't know where in the world you are, but I can see a wooden <laughs> structure behind you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm based in Southern Thailand, in the uh, Andaman uh, area of uh, Thailand. So, um, I will be sharing our experiences, and I feel really humble to be uh, to be speaking right after uh, the previous speakers. Uh, in fact, I feel it feels it fits right into the definition of local actors, and I feel I can contribute in that regard, uh, sharing what are the lessons learned and the issues um, we uh, we are facing in terms of um, harnessing climate change and its mitigation here in Southern Thailand, especially linking to uh, development, environmental degradation. So it's a, kind of a, a specific kind of like holistic um, uh, look at uh, climate change and its ramifications down here in Southern Thailand. Um, may, I, may I introduce you before you tell us more about Southern Thailand? Sure. Yeah. Fantastic. So Pierre is a research associate of SOAS Centre for Southeast Asian Studies. So thank you, Rachel, who is here for, for making that connection. Um, Pierre's work is on social and ecological systems. He's worked extensively with the World Health Organization. And today he's safeguarding, he's talking about coastal resilience in the time of crisis um, in the southern Andaman. And of course, as SOAS is a, a regional studies school, we had an interesting debate in advance of this as to where the Andaman actually was, um, whether it was in South or Southeast Asia. We decided I've it was in it. both. Yeah. So Pierre, think, thank I you think, very much and uh, welcome to SOAS. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to learn with you and share our views down there. I apologize, I'm not Thai, obviously, but all the team down here, is indeed Thai and uh, I mean from various places in Thailand of course Thailand is not an homogen homogeneous uh, culture um, so um, if I may share my screen because I have a presentation it may help see uh, some visuals from it so how do we do that mm -hmm. Cannot see. Oh, I'm, yeah, here it is. All right. Do you see well the presentation? Okay. So 
So, <clears throat> so as as you as you mentioned, and just um, uh, briefly corroborate what we are saying. So I'm 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 here. I'm as, as a researcher, associate researcher for SOAS, but also um, I've been over the last few years uh, leading a certain number of community-based uh, biodiversity conservation projects in uh, the Andaman region of Southern Thailand, uh, Krabi in particular. So what, what I thought was appropriate, especially following the, the, the previous uh, discussions, was to specifically highlight three main issues we are facing, and that I believe by being addressed or at least acknowledged will shed some light uh, into a further discussion that you know uh, we can have during the COP26, for example, and beyond. Um, so I would just briefly start with a description of where we are at and uh, what we are trying to do down here. So nature-minded is what we kind of like uh, use as an umbrella. It's essentially a portfolio of projects. It combines or it focuses on strong local partnerships with different institutions, different fishing communities and non-fishing communities. Um, we bring in uh, technical capacity in, 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 in relation to uh, monitoring data and monitoring you know, biodiversity situation in, in helping with any very local, very local conservation projects accounting for the realities of the fishing communities down here. And indeed, this leads to contextualized solutions in terms of what can be done pragmatically. Um, and indeed, it's towards ecosystem restoration and uh, building capacity, adaptive capacity, uh, towards resilience and or transformation. It's particularly difficult and relevant uh, in this time as um, in the context of the climate crisis, the global environmental degradation, and the COVID pandemic. And this is, I would say, in order of magnitude. I mean, the COVID pandemic has been really, really, really um, impacting people livelihood down here. I mean, everywhere in the world, but I would say particularly vivid down here in terms of practice and exposure and vulnerability um, in relation to climate change indeed as well. Uh, so that's what we're doing down here. Um, issue number one that we are um, that I think can, by being defined and harnessed or described, can help move the agenda forward. Um, indeed, we're not talking about just one crisis, but many of them. And I don't want necessarily to bring attention to all the tiny details in this uh, sphere on the right. But indeed, as you all know, better than me probably, it's very complex and there's a lot of nested issues and feedbacks and synergies and what we realize down here from a very practical standpoint is yes, the climate, climate change has an impact in terms of you know, potential for um, deriving livelihood, fishing, uh, the quality of the environment and the impact on uh, natural resources. But down the line, <clears throat> what really, I would say, um, impact on an everyday basis is really the, the, the social turmoil associated with uh, the COVID impacts, the, the proximal environmental degradation that are exacerbated by climate change. So what we are trying to do is really to dissect and at least acknowledge this nested, nestedness of issues. And by doing so, prioritize or identify the entry points. And I'll come to that uh, a little bit uh, later during the solution uh, part. <clears throat> the second set of issue or the second issue is really the urgency and scale. In few words, it feels overwhelming. Like down here, plastic pollution, it's just like insane. Um, we have a lot of, uh, you know, it feels like all the, the boundaries have been crossed. And as, you know, we have heard here and there again and again, um, it really feels like uh, we are reaching tipping points, we are going through thresholds, and that the system is really like out of control. And it may well be in, uh, out of control. And it points to the need for adaptive management, indeed. Um, one comment to mention that this is, you know, illustrated what we, what uh, people working on resilience-based uh, strategy have been highlighting. You know, the tipping points and you know the threshold that have been um, uh, passed and surpassed. Um, so, 
the third issue, which is really also, you know, speaking to the previous ones, is how can we um, um, foster decentralized leadership and autonomy in terms of you know actions, which is one of our focus. And with the work we've been conducted with uh, Rachel uh, Harrison in the past, um, this is we came to the realization in Southeast Asia in general, and particularly in Thailand. Um, with such a, a ingrained hierarchy and status and power structure, it's very difficult to, to trigger momentum towards um, ownership of issues because there is a need for uh, at the onset of any somehow engagement programs that will be beneficial to advance the agenda uh, for climate change mitigation and environmental degradation mitigation, et cetera, et cetera. We need autonomy of local conservation groups that are not just uh, obeying um, the agenda, national agenda. So those local groups could, could actually contextualize this agenda. But it's, we, it, we found it to be very difficult despite our, all our good intentions and uh, methodology and expertise on the matter. So I think this is, and I'm sure Rachel could, uh, could confirm that, it's, uh, this is one uh, issue we found we need to, to navigate in order to uh, bring the agenda forward. Um, not just the very hierarchical and, and, and structured uh, Southeast Asian hierarchy, but also you know, the habit or the, the capacity of people to be content and accept and therefore not challenge a study quo. So this is indeed very tricky, but those issues, I think in a nutshell, um, highlight the, or, or, I mean, points uh, are pointers uh, or indicate what needs to be uh, understood, navigated, uh, highlighted, at, uh, at least acknowledged. And so given this, we're implementing a certain number of solutions practically. So I won't go through everything here. I'm just like skipping through. Um, in all our project and attempting to move things forward, along a uh, more resilient uh, side. Uh, we are like really conducting, and this is tricky, understanding the power relations, all the actors, all the, the, the group of actors, the groups, et cetera, et cetera, performing stakeholder analysis regularly, uh, meeting with all the institutional officials locally, all the formal and informal officials, um, conducting participatory mapping as a, uh, you know, a way to, um, to gather information and to, uh, to catalyze uh, co-design -so co -co solutions. For instance, in terms of um, conservation area development and co-management of those areas. Um, what we found very, very important and very pragmatic is we cannot speak of climate change, we cannot speak of um, biodiversity conservation or natural resources management at, at, the at the, you know, first. We need to really come up understanding that people that are at the forefront of climate change and uh, environmental uh, conservation or, you know, natural resources um, exploitation and depending closely on it, um, they are also very, struggling on an everyday basis and they are in survival mode. And so understanding that and coming up with, you know, practical win-win solutions, like for example, um, developing um, uh, seagrass nursery, crab banks that are bringing income, but also inherently are linked with the preservation of the ecosystem these crabs are from is one tangible pragmatic uh, solution we are setting in place. We're collaborating with the, the Environmental Justice Foundation, which is, you know, leaning towards the activism side. So it's not just uh, research and uh, development, it's also, you know, um, advocacy and ad activism. And so establishing pathway for net recycling. So those nets, you know, uh, are not left drifting away and catching, you know, uh, uh, sea life, but at the same time providing income um, and, and bringing awareness on the issue. Third aspect is developing with all the institutions around um, uh, a framework for uh, ecotourism development and certification. So, and of course, this is related to transformative education uh, altogether. So I won't speak much further. I'm happy to, uh, to answer questions, but I thought it was really showcasing the issues we are facing and what we believe can address those issues or at least showcase the kind of pragmatic solutions we are setting in place in Southern Thailand, Southeast Asia in general. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's uh, very important to hear from what's happening really on the ground. Uh, if Navarroz was still here, I would have asked him how his more recent work on climate change connected to his earlier work on groundwater capitalism. But I've lost that opportunity for the moment. Um, Rachel, do you have anything to add at this point as, a, as you're here? <clears throat> I don't think I do actually. I mean, just to reiterate the point that Pierre was making about the kind of cultural issues that we've faced, both in sort of public health and in and environmental work in Thailand. That I mean, we're also very aware of the fact that we are, in to some extent, outsiders. But the but the discourses around changing behaviour are also dominated by sort of internal power forces as well which have a, a connection to outside forces and those things are really interesting to negotiate so I think that's that's some of the things that, that Pierre and I have worked on together and it's a very interesting minefield. Thank you very much. Could I just ask Pierre, could you um, just say a little bit more for the benefit of the participants in the in the Zoom event, a little bit more about the Save Andaman network please? Ah, um, so it's a very interesting organization. It's an NGO. It's very, very local. It's based in Trang. And in the past, it, it's been uh, focusing on establishing a network of local groups interested and in, uh, engaged in, in um, preserving coastal livelihoods, including the, the natural resources associated to it, focusing on seagrasses, focusing on mangroves, uh, to some extent coral reef, um, so it's led by women. It's very cool. Uh, like, uh, and we worked regularly with them. In fact, most of our community, community engagement processes and uh, you know, actions are led by, by their, their members. And of course, we have team meetings and you know, strategic you know, planning, et cetera. But it's, um, it's really cool. Uh, they, have, uh, they have like now, in the past, they were like in Trang. I don't know if your geography of uh, South Thailand is, uh, is uh, sharp. But you just south of Krabi, we have the province of Trang. North of Krabi, we have the province of Panga. And then we have Phuket, not, not far. So in, they were linking and having, you know, uh, sessions and community engagement meetings and, um, you know, uh, group community support and community development uh, workshops from Trang to Panga and effectively uh, addressing issue of coastal resilience, coastal livelihood all along the Andaman coast in, uh, in Southern Thailand. So very, very interesting group very uh, focused on uh, community engagement, uh, local ownerships, um, ethical representation of different uh, uh, ethnic mi minority, uh, gender, uh, gender representations as well. So very, very, very fun to work with them and very inspiring. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pierre. And thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you very much Thailand. for the invitation. And, and thanks again, Rachel, for making that connection much appreciated thank you rachel okay thank you very much so next the next speaker we have yasuku kamiyama who is joining us from japan evening in japan uh, yasuku is the director of social systems division of the national institute for environmental studies and lots of her work takes on um, ir sort of international relations approaches to negotiations and organizations. And she's written extensively about COP analysis, about policy in Japan, but also about international and comparative perspectives uh, on energy transition and, and carbon reduction. So yes, Uko, a very warm welcome um, to SAAS and the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Everybody, um, thank you for having me to this excellent, uh, exciting event. Uh, my name is Yasuko Kameyama. Uh, I work for National Institute for Environmental Studies. It's a, a government funded research institute and the Ministry of the Environment. And we have about 200 permanent researchers all working on um, environmental studies. 
Um, so today I've been given 10 minutes to explain to you the latest developments of climate change policy in Japan. And uh, let me uh, share my screen. Unfortunately, my Wi-Fi is, is uh, quite unstable. So let me turn off my video while I make a presentation. Okay, I hope you can see my slides. And uh, okay. okay, so uh, let me move on. So um, here you see um, Japan's greenhouse gas emissions trend since 1960. And uh, um, you can see that emissions uh, kept on growing and growing even after adoption of um, UNFCCC in 1992. And emission um, started um, decreasing at around 2008, um, mainly due to introduction of uh, nuclear power plants um, to meet the, the Kyoto Protocol emission reduction target between 2008 to 2012. But after we had a, a serious um, earthquake in 2011, and we had to shut down all the nuclear power plants. And so, um, so we started using coal power plants again, and that's why emission went up until 2013. And then uh, emission started going down again since 2013, mainly because we started um, introduction of renewable energy, especially solar power. Um, Japan's NDC emission reduction target for the year 2030 used to be minus 26% uh, from 2013. And we used to aim for 80% um, reduction by 2050. However, um, Japan um, revised its emission reduction target in the last um, climate leadership um, summit um, hosted by the Biden administration administration in the United States uh, last April. So our new um, target is a minus 46% reduction from 2013 for the year to 2030 and net zero by 2050. Um, here, I want to explain to you how Japan um, emission target is set. Um, the, this is how Japan used to um, determine our emission reduction target. This is a traditional process. First, um, economics uh, was taken into account. Cost of emission reduction uh, was perceived to be very high. Um, it's mainly because the voices of energy intensive industries such as um, iron, steel, and cement and electric power companies had the, the, the most influential voices in Japan. And uh, we also used to have a very strong iron triangle. It's a kind of uh, relationship between heavy industry and ministry and uh, political leaders. So all these got together and uh, uh, stressed that Japan uh, would harm its economic activities if we um, set a very stringent emission reduction target. The second point is about foreign policy. Japan always used to compare its energy efficiency level with major emitters such as the United States and China, and insisted that these emitters should be reducing their emissions first. So um, uh, with all these factors put together, um, Japan's emission reduction target used to be very, very uh, um, um, uh, small. I mean, not so much uh, as significant. However, this time, um, the, the, the um, policy making process was very, very different. We had a uh, very um, heavy influence from foreign policy because the United Kingdom and many other countries had emission uh, net zero target. And seeing um, a chance that Biden to win the US presidential election in autumn 2020 last year, um, Japan thought it would feel kind of ashamed if it became 
became the last country to announce net zero. So that's kind of foreign policy uh, factor. And uh, in addition, many Japanese companies, particularly financial sector, uh, started facing international initiatives such as um, TCFD and ESG investments. So um, that's why um, the former Prime Minister Suga announced net zero in la uh, last October. Uh, um, 2020. And we also revised the 2030 target to minus 40% from 2013. And then um, now we are revising our energy plan to reduce amount of uh, uh, coal um, power, power plants. Actually, this is Japan's very first time to set emission reduction target before um, determining our um, energy plan. So, so this is something new uh, we haven't um, um, experienced before. So what's missing? A very important factor is missing in Japan. It's citizens' voices. Um, in Japan, school strikes and climate marches, all these protests from um, um, citizens are not very popular. And people uh, um, remain quiet in a way. So climate change is never an issue in, at the elections. Um, I, I put up a, a picture in Japan. It, this is a rare, rare situation where um, climate marches are held in Tokyo. We had only about 20 or 30 people, <laughs> very small number of people protesting. But on the other hand, we also experienced a very severe flood um, due to typhoons. Um, but however, in Japan, media may merely frame extreme weather events um, with uh, climate change. And I think that's why people still do not um, uh, have, have an idea, I mean, to, do not try to relate all these extreme weather events to uh, um, mitigation, I mean, importance of um, aiming at net zero emissions. And uh, uh, so we are now uh, uh, coming up to COP26. And as for Japanese government, Article 6 related um, negotiation is going to be the, the major issue um, because we have a mechanism called joint crediting mechanism. Um, since 2015, the Japanese government um, have had a, a bilateral cooperative um, agreement with um, 17 developing countries, mainly in Asian countries. And what Japan do is to um, 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 kind of transfer low carbon technologies to developing countries, partner countries, and uh, implement emission reduction project in developing countries. And after the emission reduction was uh, observed in those developing countries, part of emission reduction credits will go back to Japan um, to, to, uh, to um, balance the amount of technologies given to the partner countries. So Japan has been um, making this collaboration with developing countries uh, for, for six years now. And uh, therefore it's very important for the Japanese government to be able to get a credit at, um, under the Paris Agreement that this um, um, uh, transfer of credits would be uh, officially acknowledged uh, under the UNFCC. And uh, as beside this Article 6 related issues, Japan has another issue, and it's about exports of coal power plants to developing countries. <laughs> and uh, it has been a kind of um, Japan problem so for, for many years. And actually, Japan has been awarded by environmental NGOs um, Fossil of the Day Award. And uh, um, I, I think this kind of awarding uh, will continue during COP26. So this is Japan's situation. So I think this is end of my talk and uh, I will be happy to answer any questions from you. Thank you so much. Yes, Uko, thank you very much in, indeed. Um, the fossil of the day award had a 
raised a sad smile. Um, I wanted to ask what happened, what has happened? I was thinking about your graphs and, and the narrative. What has happened to the Iron Triangle um, post 2013-14 when the, when the graph changed direction? Very good question. Um, um, actually, that triangle is not as strong as it used to be um, for several reasons, actually. But, uh, but one of the reasons is because um, due to this earthquake in 2011 and a nuclear power plant accident, uh, Japanese electric companies um, became kind of um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the, the dispatched and now it's kind of under the government's uh, control. So that is why energy um, uh, intensive industries has less power or influence than uh, they used to have. And nowadays, um, some other industries like financial sectors and uh, um, um, other service related sectors have stronger voices to uh, um, uh, ask the government to uh, go for um, more stringent emission reduction targets. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Oh, well, in that case, I'll allow myself one further one. Could you, I mean, it, it, it's a difficult one to frame, but could you explain the relationship between the joint crediting mechanism and the export of power stations, coal-fired power stations, and how those two policies sit together? Is it simply that they belong to different parts of the government? Um, actually, both um, exporting um, you know, emission reduction and um, technology and exports of coal power plants are under the same ministry, Ministry of um, Economy, Trade and Industry, METI. Um, so they have all the power, uh, I, mean, I mean, the uh, administrative power to support Japanese industry to export Japanese uh, uh, products and technologies. And however, um, you know, they, they try to fix, I mean, frame those two different types of technology in a way to say um, these technologies are good um, as to be seen under JCM, um, Joint Crediting Mechanism. And they, on the other hand, they try to hide uh, some other exporting um, coal power plants uh, just to say that those coal power plants are much more energy um, efficient than traditional old type of coal power plants. And that's how um, the Japanese government has been explaining uh, or um, to justify uh, the exportation of coal power plants. Mm. Thank you very much. I also bring to mind that India now has something called green coal uh, as, as the market in a, in a particular kind of way. So, Yasuko, thank you very much for having joined us. And thank you to Fabio Gigi from the Japanese, uh, Japan Research Center at SOAS for having put us in touch and for having made the connection. So thank you very much. So we're Thanks. now going to another poll from Tom. Apologies, I'm trying to manage uh, putting it up and putting this, the, uh, should be the same link as before, but I will post it again here. Please do click on this. This is a poll uh, set up by Yasuko, and she she, she um, suggested it with regard to the UK, but I've, I've done it with regard to your own country. Um, and the question is, what is the most critical factor for nurturing public support for aiming at net zero? So in your own experience um, and your own view, but related to your country, your, your country, how do you nurture that support and what's been the experience of, of pushing that? Um,
I shall get this off. Everyone to see. Hopefully we should be seeing the results now. So we've heard a lot um, during the, the COVID-19 era about being decisions being led by the science. And it's something that we know in climate change hasn't always been the case. This ex experience seems to suggest the same um, limited role for that scientific evidence. Although we hope that that's uh, directly and indirectly informing uh, both political leadership and the mass media. Certainly, um, a lot of the mass movements around climate recently, if you think of the, uh, the, the Greta Thunberg's youth movements and uh, the, the recent marches, particularly the, particularly the ones uh, just before the start of the COVID crisis during the UN uh, climate summit, a lot of it was all being led by the science. It was a real push, I guess, because you know in the US you had uh, President Trump kind of being a bit anti-science. That's a good spread. But the political leadership, I mean, that we do need. I'm I'm still a firm believer we do need those these high level political events. I think it sends an important signal. It, it cascades down government that climate change is 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 a real issue across the whole of government, and that it's part of. For me, the Paris Declaration was about sending if nothing else a normative message that part of the role of government is to lead on tackling climate change uh, and i think that was a big step change for me in the way that the unfccc um reached out rather than just saying we're going to set legally binding targets like the kyoto agreement but actually to say this is about setting norms across uh, all the government across every country of the world and technology still a driving force. Ed, back to you. Thank you very much, Tom. I thought it was amazingly interesting, actually. That, that was a really great poll. Uh, a little bit surprising. OK, so next we have Kwajo Awusu, who I hope is here. Kwajo, your name is on my screen. Is your yes, I'm here. available? Yeah, brilliant. So, fa fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Kwajo is the head of the Department of uh, Geography and Resource Development at the University of Ghana. And his research looks at what I interpreted to be socio-cultural systems and how they interact with climate and climate change adaption. So Kwajo, um, I extend a warm welcome to you from SOAS and for the Centre for African Studies as well. So, thank you. Welcome. I'll try to share um, my uh, something I put together. All right. I hope you can see it now. Um, so I've been looking at bits here and there on the climate change in general, mostly how it affects agriculture and every now and then on, on water resources. So I've done a few things with. Uh, uh, Frauke in the past and uh, with uh, Giuseppina and um, we're looking forward. So I want to share the, the pathways Ghana has taken through the energy uh, sector and where we are now and what may be probably of interest to Ghana and some of the developing countries uh, uh, as we go to the COP. Uh, so, yes, I think that um, basically Ghana has um, depended more on um, biofuel and wood fuel in particular, uh, charcoal, and this is how it's, it's processed and sent to the market in Ghana. Uh, forms charcoal and uh, in the urban areas mostly, and uh, fuel wood uh, or wood fuel in the in the rural areas. It is forms the bulk of the energy source for cooking and heating and stuff like that. But of course, electricity has also been 
championed since the early 60s with investment mainly in hydro, um, the Akosombo Dam project, the first major dam project by Ghana, really gave Ghana a lot of power that the urban centers, because of the, the systems could support to the urban areas will need. So much that um, Kaiser Aluminum Company was brought in because of the cheap and abandoned power to uh, melt aluminum in Ghana for export. So uh, Ghana had, in fact, been dependent on hydro. But going forward, uh, the hydro was was not enough. So what what actually uh, has been happening is that policy has evolved, and um, I think that with the impact the hydro was having on society, the best option was uh, to go in for Therma. So as it is now, Therma is now, has already displaced hydro. Uh, it's, it's in the scheme of looking at the UK and elsewhere, it's not much, but in percentage wise, it still tells the story. So hydro, uh, has now gone down significantly, about 38%. Um, uh, Therma is about 64, 68%. But um, in all this discussion, what is clear is that the renewables or uh, other clean energy outside hydro is very small. Renewables are still about 1.1%. So that, there isn't much. But the story from the climate point becomes a country that has strategized to depend mostly on hydro, uh, then um, the vagaries of weather really does affect uh, uh, power generation. So the major dam, as used as an example here, within the Volta Basin, before I even go on to that, so Ghana has um, three mega dams or dams that are classified as large dams. The Akosumbo, the Pong, and the Bui, which was recently built. But interestingly, in, interestingly enough, from the climate perspective, all these three dams are stuck on one basin. So it's still the Volta Basin. So that means that to a large extent, if there are rainfall shortfalls, especially upstream, then all the three dams are really affected. So, but um, the, the climatology of West Africa is such that you have a strong interannual variability, but not even so much as multi-decada variability. So you can enter a phase of about um, 20 to 25 years as um, earlier recognized by Gavin in 1992 or so that the West African uh, rainfall goes through an oscillation of 25 to 30 years where you have more than average rainfall or less than average rainfall. And that, that creates problem for strategizing through uh, hydro. So that, that, that is some of the justification uh, also for looking for uh, uh, Therma. And of course, we all know the implication for uh, the environment. So when Ghana had depended solely on the Akosombo, so we, we've had intermittent and sometimes sustained uh, uh, light out or blackout. So because all because of uh, production shortfalls. So uh, in 2007, for instance, Ghana lost about 6% uh, of GDP because of non-sustained uh, power production or power cut. So all these things are a daily um, reality in, in, in Ghana. So, but then if you look at Ghana's energy policy, as, uh, without doubt, this is obvious that 
between hydro renewables, uh, they are better for the environment than the thermal. In Ghana, the thermal mainly, we are now touting that it's, okay, it's, it's a little better because we have also switched from crude oil to um, gas. A lot of the production is now from gas and Ghana has invested heavily in gas. All, all, be, all that said, the downside is that if you look at Ghana's energy policy and strategy, Ghana intends to export. As at now, I think that then Ghana will be a net importer because under the country's obligation, because of the tributaries of the Volta River, Ghana exports power to Burkina Faso, Togo, and Benin, but we also import a lot from Cote d'Ivoire. The, the power in Cote d'Ivoire is also cheaper, far, far cheaper than Ghana, at least the tax component on, on that. But Ghana's strategy also aims at exporting energy to the, the sub-region. So beyond the environmental impacts or the, the climate concerns, if you do the thermal, then the, the cost is higher and Ghana will not be competitive. So the renewables then. So this shows that along the coast, you can have some wind potential and there is a ridge here, which also provides um, a lot of wind potential. Solar abound in Ghana. Uh, so in the immediate, the strategy is to go to about 10%. I think this has been revised from 2020 to 2030. And, and the critical aspect of why this potential is not tapped into is technology and also financing. The investments that have come to Ghana are mainly in the thermal sector. Uh, Ghana was panicking. People took advantage of that. We needed energy, we needed it quick. When in, in 2012, 20, 12, uh, 13, 14, we had very serious uh, shortfalls in production. So a lot of investment came to Ghana, but they were mostly in the thermal sector. So the uh, enormous potential exists. Uh, the capacity is there, the population is expanding. We just, we just got to uh, above 30 million with our census that has just finished. The demand is very high. In fact, Ghana is still about 85% um, electricity, has about 85% energy electricity penetration. So we still hope to do that. So as, as for that, the need is there. The master plan is there to get that. So uh, in concluding, what I will say is that with Ghana's example, which is actually a shining example in the sub-region, I'm a Ghanaian. When Nigerians come to Ghana and uh, we complain about electricity situation, they, they don't take it lightly at all. They believe we, we probably are, are far, far better. So for the developing countries, unless the COP is interested in discussing probably uh, promoting solar in terms of, so I'll combine my two points here, in terms of the investment and the techno technological know-how. And then we keep receiving uh, uh, old technologies from uh, uh, higher and middle income countries coming to us. We will accept them because the need is for a lot of power to be produced and to be produced quickly. So everybody will be interested in what will give us the power. In fact, the, under the Millennium Challenge, the US came to Ghana and was happy what they were trying to do. The first problem is probably the China approach somehow, get the power. So they didn't, for instance, restrict what Ghana could invest in. Everything was on the table. I liked it, but for the climate part, uh, it, it doesn't look good. So I will conclude by saying that technology transfer and financing arrangement that favors investment in renewable energy will be, uh, will be an, a, a way to go 
for developing countries like Ghana and the others. I will end my presentation here. And if you please have any contribution or question, I'll be willing to answer. Thank you. Yeah, Joe, thank you very much. I found that to be really interesting. And you, I think you managed to explain excellently the bind that countries like Ghana face in trading one thing off against the other, the interrelatedness of problems, um, but also the, the checks and balances of different kinds of costs. I have a, a very straightforward question, which is about when, when Ghana, you mentioned the US, but when Ghana looks for investment um, and for partners at COP for investment, perhaps, where, do, where does Ghana turn to? Is it to international in organizations or is it to private capital? Um, I, I would say both because um, the US mentioning came in because that was a uh, direct foreign assistance by the US government through the Millennium Challenge. So if you are doing good governance and all that, they, they will support you. But I think beyond that, a lot of what has come into Ghana since about 2012, there about when we had a lot of the challenge has been a private investment in, in, in power generation. And most of them had been thermal. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And has Ghana been using um, Turkish made generation ships as well? Yeah, car power. Yes, so yeah. so so that 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 is uh you think about it. How long are you going to develop the the renewable capacity? And then you call an investor in in Dubai or Saudi and Ghana case. I think some of the investment came from Dubai. So Dubai investors come in. They sign a pack. They 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 buy the the plant, and in three months you have a lot of power produced for you. So that is what I'm saying. The cops should look at that because if that becomes a model, uh, then we, we will have a problem going forward. Kwadjo, thank you very much for, for joining us and for sharing insights from Ghana. Really much appreciated. Thank you for taking the time and for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... We're all astonishingly on time and we are. Uh, it gives me pleasure to, to welcome Isabel Hilton, who I know has already had a very busy morning. Uh, welcome, Isabel. Thank you very uh, Isabel much. Isabel is a research, sorry, a research associate uh, at SOAS at the moment and a very well-known writer and broadcaster for both print uh, and wireless media. Um, Isabel has been involved with influen the influential open democracy.net, but he is here today as the founder and senior advisor of independent uh, nonprofit organization called China Dialogue, which aims to promote a common understanding of China's environmental challenges. Isabel, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Edward. And I'm going to attempt the um, miracle of sharing my screen. Um, so I hope that's going to work. Good. Has that worked? Yes. Okay. So um, the question is, what do we want um, from from China at at the COP? Uh, I'm sure I don't need to explain that that China is the world's biggest emitter, uh, that China has been the world's biggest emitter since 2005, and that its numbers continue to climb, that it consumes by far um, the world largest proportion of the world's coal, et cetera, et cetera. China made a very big bet on coal to fuel its industrial revolution. And, um, and that meant that uh, making a, a serious uh, transition to a less uh, polluting primary energy source is a very uh, big task indeed. So we're in a, a climate emergency. Um, and for uh, reasons, again, that I, that I don't have to go into, um, we 
are not doing well enough. This is currently uh, the state of play. Uh, as you see in terms of, of planning, China uh, comes into the highly insufficient category. Uh, it's in good company there. And the only country that is currently compatible, has plans compatible with the 1.5 degree is the Gambia. Uh, everyone else is sort of doing various various degrees of not good enough, and China is in the really quite not good enough. And because it is so big, uh, this matters more for China um, than than it does um, for uh, for less significant countries. Um, there is still time for countries to improve their position, um, but uh, this doesn't mean. Uh, that China or it, its position in this league table doesn't mean that China isn't interested in climate change or indeed that it doesn't take it seriously or that it's failing to act. It's more that its actions uh, have quite a lot of Chinese characteristics. So here are two common beliefs. The things that people say about China uh, when they look at COP and they look at China's uh, 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 emissions profile, that China has done nothing about climate change that China is not interested in climate diplomacy. Um, neither of these positions is in fact accurate. So China has a long and consistent history of engaging with the UNFCCC process. And this is it. it, it it actually attended the Stockholm conference, which is 50 years ago. It attended the Rio Earth Summit from which so much of, this, of, of these mechanisms emerged. It's been, it joined the UNFCCC and it's a party to the Kyoto Protocol. So the Kyoto Protocol, if you remember, those of you who follow this kind of policy quite closely will remember that it divided uh, members into Annex One and non-Annex One. Annex One countries were countries like Britain or Germany or the United States that had done well out of emitting carbon. They had had early industrial revolutions and that they were historically responsible for most of the carbon in the atmosphere. They therefore had a moral uh, responsibility and uh, technical and industrial and, and economic capacity to, to assist countries that uh, were less responsible, but were still developing to make a cleaner, uh, a model of development and that uh, China was a big beneficiary of that being a non-annex one signature. One of the many difficulties in climate diplomacy was that between uh, the negotiation of the Kyoto Protocol and say the Copenhagen summit, which ended in tears, as you will recall, China had gone from being a relatively minor uh, uh, player in terms of emissions to the world's biggest. And its status within the um, within the treaty uh, arrangements had not changed. And so people, you know, with some justification said, you know, if China is still treated as a developing country, but is the world's biggest emitter, then, you know, we're all rather wasting our time. And that was one of the issues at Copenhagen that was fixed in Paris because we no longer have that binary. and We no longer have a kind of top down legal mandatory obligation um, for countries. So it now becomes uh, voluntary, you bring to the table what you can bring, but uh, recognizing that the promises on the table are insufficient, certainly at the beginning, it, the ratchet mechanism, which we're now looking at in Glasgow, was also built in. So now we look to China to improve uh, its offer. China, to date, has improved its offer in a number of ways. The net zero target for 2060 uh, is a significant improvement. The announcement that it would no longer build external coal is a significant improvement. The 2030 target is very soft and it was um, on the table in Paris. Um, it hasn't, it was soft then, uh, this is six years ago, it hasn't really improved. So there is room for improvement. Nevertheless, China has also been uh, working, if you like, on a number of, of um, sectors that have positive carb uh, emissions benefits. Um, or could have. Uh, one is the reduction in carbon intensity. And again, uh, carbon intensity is the amount of carbon you emit for every dollar or unit of value of GDP. So it is in, in effect an, efficient, an efficiency measure. When China began this, it was extremely inefficient in both um, raw materials and, and energy inputs to its production. 
it's made quite a lot of progress in this. That doesn't directly result in uh, emissions reductions because you can become more efficient and still grow, and therefore your emissions continue to grow, and that is uh, China's case. However, as a necessary um, preparation for reduction, uh, this, was, this was pretty important. On the positive side, China also 10 years ago began to invest heavily in uh, renewable and low carbon technologies with the ambition since realized of becoming the major supplier to the world of low carbon technologies. And at that point, it becomes uh, it China acquires a, a direct interest in uh, a carbon constrained world. So China has built its industrial strategy on the assumption that the world will seek to go uh, to low carbon energies and 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 so you know China remains unlike the United States uh, systemically committed the United States we we live in peril of the next election uh, we've seen the United States come and go in Kyoto in the UNFCCC and in its commitment to climate because of the swings of domestic policies and we don't actually have that um, obviously in in China however the emissions continue to rise there is a continuing dependence on coal for domestic primary energy, and there is a reluctance, which I think is going to be highly contentious in Glasgow, to commit to a 1.5 degree target. So why is that? Well, the 1.5 degree target, you may recall, rose in Paris. Paris Agreement commits formally to a two degree target, that is keeping uh, the rise in global average temperatures to below two degrees. 1.5 arose at the request of uh, the small island states, of the vulnerable countries, who said, rightly, as it turns out, that two degrees wasn't a safe uh, a limit and that it needed to be 1.5. China was very much taken aback by this in Paris and regarded it as a, somehow a machination of, of the United States. Uh, to embarrass China, they complained there was no pathway, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So they have always been suspicious of 1.5 degree target because it is, you know, obviously a more difficult target to reach. Um, however, uh, holding on to to that non-recognition, given what we now know, given what the science has told us, given the evidence we have of accelerating climate impacts, I think will make China, uh, I think that's quite a vulnerable thing diplomatically um, for China. And the other thing, um, as, I, as I mentioned, that 2030 target, when the 2030 target was, uh, was set, that's the, the date at which China will peak its emissions, climate modelers, essentially said, there's plenty of room inside that target. We could, one modeler told me, we could, China could peak at 2022, 2023. So the expectation has always been that this was a target which allowed China to, you know, make a kind of declaration uh, in which it would, you know, dramatically improve its offer. However, that hasn't happened. Um, and, and the current thinking based on what is in the 14th five year plan, which still has a lot of coal in it, the current thinking suggests that if we do see a shift, it won't be much better than to 2028. And the problem with that is the later you peak, you know, the steeper, uh, the steeper the ask is, uh, after that, so up to twenty twenty, up to twenty thirty, is such a key a key moment to set us on the on a on a right path. So, what do we need China to do? Well, it would be nice if China would make a declaration of increased ambition, uh, because frankly, the diplomatic atmosphere in Glasgow could do with that. Um, there is an enormous emissions gap. We're not going to close it in Glasgow, but a, a strong declaration from China uh, would would encourage people to think that. We could close it at some point um, and to commit to align uh, with the 1.5 uh, degree target. Um, I think also given you know, that China is now the world's second largest economy, again, we have this ambivalent position. Is China still just a developing country or is it the world's you know, second largest economy? Is it a major economic superpower? If it's the second, what can we expect China to do in terms of making its uh, financial contributions to the least developed countries um, and to uh, support for adaptation and mitigation? So um, those would help. This is the gap. This is what we need uh, China to help close. And, and you can see from that blue wedge 
that's where we are. Uh, so we're not getting there fast enough. China is a very big slice of that. It's a very big slice of not getting there fast enough. Um, and so again, whatever China does, the pressure will definitely be on it uh, to do more. Uh, there are still many countries that have yet to submit targets, however. Um, so again, China's not the worst in terms of compliance with the UNFCCC um, process, uh, but it's not the best either. And because it is so prominent, um, we look to China not only to increase its domestic offer, but also to begin to use its diplomatic clout to um, encourage others. China's diplomacy tends to serve rather narrow domestic interests rather than the broader climate effort. Um, and that I think we can hope might emerge from the recent uh, declaration on coal on the Belt and Road for which China had been much criticized. The second part of that declaration was that China would assist other countries, its host countries uh, to develop renewable system. If China were to do that, that would be an enormous contribution to helping countries leapfrog the high emitting, high carbon sector and, um, uh, and avoid uh, future emissions and avoid stranded assets. And there are great gains for China, were China to do that. Um, China, China's reputation and partly as a result of wolf warrior diplomacy is not terribly high around the world at the moment. Um, there are real positives for China in a more proactive uh, climate position. There is a good story to tell here if China uh, were to uh, increase its domestic ambition and help others uh, to avoid getting locked into a high carbon pathway. So that's what I would, if I were to be advising the Chinese government, that's what I would advise it to do. Um, fortunately for the Chinese government, perhaps I'm not in that position, uh, but I think that's what many people will be hoping, uh, a conclusion that China comes to um, by itself. Thank you. Isabel, thank you very much. That was really provocative. Um, because we have such an express format, we don't really have time for extended questions. But we have one in the chat from uh, Jing Zhang that I would like to share. Uh, and I think she asks two questions, but I'm going to go with the first one. And it, because I, I find it really interesting. And it's rather simply, where do people get the idea that China is not interested in climate change from? <laughs> you know, why does that idea circulate so powerfully? And the second question, which is one of my own, is does China Dialogue have COP plans? Yes, uh, we have COP plans to answer your question. We will have a team there throughout. Um, I won't be there in the first week, but I will be there in the second week. Uh, we, we have been publishing a lot across our websites on, on for, well, since 2006, we have been, we have been publishing on, on climate change in China. So if you need background, if you need to understand how we got to where we are, uh, do have a look. As to the question of why people have that impression, I wish I knew because um, it's, I think it's partly size and unfamiliarity. China is the world's biggest emitter. China became slightly the bad object in Copenhagen and when, when the talks broke down. But since then, China has really done an enormous amount, not just in terms of, um, of diplomacy, but also China brought its capacity to manufacture at scale into the renewables sector and has lowered the price of the solar panels on my roof and everybody else's roof, you know, by a very large margin. And that has meant that building a renewable system is there's no longer a massive cost barrier. There are other technological barriers, but the cost barrier, you know, has pretty much been been reduced uh, to almost nothing by China. Um, but I think what remains in people's mind is the impression uh, and, and indeed the actual policy that China continues to build new coal-fired power stations at home. And, and at this point, people find that quite puzzling. I, I mean, it's something we could go into in greater depth, but the, but the problem is that that just reinforces the image that China doesn't care. And that's unfortunate. Isabel, thank you so much um, for being with us this morning. I know you had a busy morning. It's really greatly appreciated. Yeah. And thank you also to Steve Sang of the Science China Institute for making the connections between us. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, so our final speaker of the morning is Tando Nadaranan from the Department of Geography, Geoinformatics and Meteorology uh, in, in, in South Africa. I've not written down which university, I do apologize. He has a PhD from, um, planetary, in planetary sciences from John Hopkins. So welcome. I thank you very much, Ed. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, University of Pretoria, I do apologize. Yes. Uh, you can see it, right? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, good day. Um, so, the thing that I wanted to briefly talk about, yeah, this is not a very long presentation as I have only 10 minutes, is, is the agency of climate change adaptation uh, in, in Southern Africa. Um, why, why, why do we find that climate change adaptation is, is so urgent uh, in, the, uh, in the region? Um, we already are observing uh, evidence uh, of climate change impacts uh, over Southern Africa. I mean, uh, uh, many people will remember uh, last year uh, that there was a tropical cyclone that impacted uh, Mozambique, uh, which is over the eastern parts of, 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 um, of the subcontinent. And it also impacted Zimbabwe and Malawi in excess of 1,300 people lost their lives and there was extensive and extensive damage to, uh, to property. Um, again, uh, in the Cape Town area, which is uh, located uh, in the southern tip of the, of the continent, uh, there was a, 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 a very strong uh, uh, a drought that occurred in, uh, in, in 2015, 2017, and that led to a, a near day zero um, a state of affairs in terms of water availability in that region. And in the interior of the country at some point, there was also a, 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 a very strong El Nino that was observed and uh, 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 that led to, to drought as well. Right now, over the southern eastern parts of the country, there is a multi-year drought uh, that, that's been going on for, for some time and, 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 and higher frequency of um, uh, heat waves have, 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 has been observed in, in, in southern Africa. All of this is, of course, in, influenced by or, or basically impacted by the fact that southern Africa is a climate change hot hot spot um, uh, because the region is warming more rapidly than uh, uh, the global uh, rate of warming. It's actually warming at, at, at about twice the rate of, of global warming, which is a, a worrying uh, a factor. And therefore, we expect that there will be even more uh, uh, impacts of climate change in the region. Uh, uh, for example, we, 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 you know, we have the Gauteng province in South Africa, which is where Johannesburg is, is located. And, and it, it, it is therefore the econo economic hub uh, of, of, the, of the country, even uh, Southern Africa, in fact. And, and, and uh, that would have an uh, impact. Uh, so, so climate change would have uh, a very, very serious impacts uh, over that region because we expect that there would be a uh, drought uh, uh, conditions uh, prevailing going forward. Also, um, uh, we, 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 the, the, the um, multi-year uh, droughts that are already being observed, observed I expected to continue in future, which would have very, very serious impacts on, on, on maize crop and cattle industry, and therefore having a very serious implications for uh, food security uh, in the region. And clearly also because the warming is, as, is twice 
the, the global warming, the, the, warming the, the warming rate in this region is twice the warming uh, globally. Uh, and so we expect that heat waves will continue to increase in terms of frequency and intensity and, and, and therefore having very, very adverse impacts or implications on human health and, and, and mortality. And also uh, tropical cyclones are also expected to uh, continue. So I'm, I'm mentioning all of these uh, because I, I wanted to highlight the issue that uh, over South Africa um, or Southern Africa in general, climate change adaptation is, is, is it, uh, when people are, are, are arguing for uh, climate change uh, in, in Glasgow this year, uh, climate change adaptation should be high in the list of uh, issues that, that uh, are being discussed. Whilst we have, uh, whilst that is the case, of course, we should be contributing as a region to reducing, um, a, 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 you know, a, a contributions uh, to a, um, climate change uh, a, a emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but obviously, we can't uh, uh, contribute uh, to that reduction more than we are already contributing. I'm proud to say that South Africa is a very aggressive renewable energy program. Uh, to ensure a just transition on, on the one hand and on the other, ensuring energy security uh, in, the, in the country, which currently we have some problems with. Uh, we, we think that um, renewable energy would be a solution to many of the problems that we have. Um, Tando, Tando, can I just in, in, yes. interrupt you to make sure you know that we, we're not seeing your slides um, transferring through. We're still on the um, opening slide. Is that, is that intentional? I, I, Oh, no, 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 it's not. Actually, I've moved on. Sorry. Ah, OK. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. On the so, share, perhaps if you start the uh, slideshow, we might. There we go. Excellent. OK, so can you see that now? Yes, so, thank you. I'm, I, I'm sorry about that. I apologize. Um, actually, I'm, 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 I'm actually on the slide now uh, that talks to what the well, I wanted to focus on adaptation, of course, but uh, what the goals are in our national determined contribution, which I think would be the issues that would be tabled uh, as, as people are arguing uh, uh, and, and, and negotiating in, uh, at COP26. So these, these are the, the goals that uh, we, we, we will be thinking about. Um, uh, and then there is a need to enhance uh, climate change adaptation governance and, and legal frameworks. Uh, the government is, is very keen on that. And, and also to, to strengthen the scientific basis uh, of government, government discussions or government uh, efforts, uh, we, we need to have an understanding of the climate change impacts uh, for, for uh, you know, those, those limitations of uh, gl global warming. And we have a national climate change adaptation strategy, uh, the interventions of which uh, are currently being implemented, but th there will be even more aggressive implementation of these interventions uh, uh, going forward. And, um, and of course, I think it was mentioned that there is a need to be to, to have access to funding. And in particular, in our case for climate change adaptation, implementation, and as well as uh, the quantification of um, acknowledgement uh, uh, of the national adaptation and resilient uh, efforts. Uh, basically, in conclusion, because I see we are running out of time, one of the greatest needs for, for from our pers perspective is to is to accelerate climate change adaptive adaptation technology transfer and, and financing to facilitate uh, our NDC goals. And, and I'm talking about NDC goals only from the South African perspective uh, in this case, because other countries in Southern Africa have their own uh, NDC goals that, that will be tabled, I think, at COP26. And of course, the Climate Technology Center and Network is available for this. And, and I think it should be used more effectively. Those of you who are not familiar with the CTCN, 
it is the uh, uh, operational arm of the technology mechanism that's aimed at facilitating climate technology transfer to uh, to developing countries. Okay, so with that, I will I will conclude. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much indeed. That was fascinating. I I think um, <coughs> in this second session where we've heard much more about technology transfer and the need for financial mechanisms. The tone of the, the second half was quite different to the first half of today. So I thank you very much in, indeed for sharing that talk with us and for joining us at SOAS this morning. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time for the event as a whole. So I, I won't ask you questions directly, although I have many of them. Um, I would like to thank everybody who has participated in this event, the people who've organized it, particularly um, Sunil, who is hiding in the background behind the picture of SOAS on our screens. Thank you, Sunil. And also to Tom, um, who I work with on bringing this event together. I've not worked with Tom before, but I look forward to doing so again and to everybody who has facilitated connections and work towards making this happen. The express format today was perhaps a little expressful, and I would, despite the success of it, have liked a little bit more time for discussion. I think you all raised so many questions um, that it is with a little bit of frustration that I didn't, that we didn't have a, a more fulsome discussion. Um, to those of you who are still in the participants list, I really strongly encourage you to engage with COP processes, to follow the links that Tom has provided in the chat for news and, and daily updates, to, to follow the news and to get involved. Um, COP is there, uh, all the accommodation might be full, but Glasgow is still there and, and accessible. So thank you very much indeed. I will pass over to Tom for some very final words and thank you. Thanks Ed and I'm, I don't have anything more to add other than to reiterate thanks so much to all our speakers, uh, to our colleagues who made connections to those speakers, that's really appreciated and, and, and thanks to everyone for uh, for listening in. We will be posting the videos, um, a video of the whole event and we'll chop, chop up the individual um, talks as well so we can uh, you can access those shortly and we'll send a link to all those who registered for the event um, as soon as we've got those online uh, yeah one final uh, excellent vote of thanks to to our, our colleagues and partners around the world that's uh, some really fascinating insights and certainly things for for, for our cop team to take through uh, into glasgow so thank you <laughs>